All right, you bunch of yahoos, strap yourselves in for another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. In other words, shut up, sit up, and pay attention. And welcome back to another episode of Toxic Masculinity, where we are here to entertain, offend, defend anybody and everybody. So if you are a little, uh, you know, on the stitch side, better put on your man pants here because you're in, you're in for a, another big induction of mask, toxic masculinity. With my co-host here, the predator, Don Fry, yours truly, Dan, to be severed. And we have the special guest here right now. I'm not certain. He needs actually probably three or four different introductions because we have, you know. I, when Sybil, I first met him, Sybil, I, make it fast, right? <laughs> okay. When I first met him, I, I just knew him as Cactus Jack, but then we then, then came out to be in this uh, bad kind, and then there's dude love, but he's simply known as Mick Foley. We, we need to talk about your uh, the fact that you've, you've written several different books. Is, is there, to, to, I mean, are you still, do you have books that are available for sale, or, or, or well, is, somebody, have you written any new ones? I have, but here's, uh, this is a nice life lesson, I believe, something we can uh, discuss. Um, I believe the first three memoirs are available on Amazon, and the other ones, including the children's books, can uh, probably be bought on eBay, sometimes at a real great price. Um, for Christmas this past year, uh, my kids were aware that I was writing down some stories, right? So uh, I didn't go any farther than that. My daughter warned me I was working on it like it's uh, March, to, you know, 2021, She's like, Dad, don't get upset if nobody reads this. I said, ah, they don't have to read it right away as long as they know it's there for them. Because three of my four children couldn't remember what it was like to be young. Uh, my fourth one, Mickey's 21. He's on the autism spectrum, and he remembers everything. He remembers every minute detail. It's incredible. Uh, so I sat down, and I started working on this. And on Christmas morning, uh, they opened. Uh, each opened up. 150,000 words. It's a, that's a thick book. With I was able to, I'm not selling a single one. I had 25 copies made. I was able to, you know, get the great leather cover. And the deal is, I'm as proud of that as I am of the Have a Nice Day, which uh, hit number one and changed a lot of things for me because I knew it was uh, something I love doing. And so uh, the lesson is, you know, uh, sometimes I'll tell people not to let anyone dictate to you what being a success is. Uh, you know, we get to do that for ourselves. And uh, you take the concept of a WrestleMania moment and you apply it to your own life and say, I don't care that there was only 30 people there or 150 people instead of 20,000. That was as special a moment as anything I've ever done. Only 20,000? Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've only been in front of more than 20,000 on like four Kid. or five occasions. Yeah, Ricky. yeah. Oh, you had that. Oh, you had that pride run, right? Where you guys are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. We had fun. That was, what an amazing promotion that was, just that with was, the energy. It was amazing, yeah. You think it, was, UFC, it, was, it was like WrestleMania every three months, you know. I think UFC may have taken a look at what you guys were do doing and thought. They yeah. should have. They didn't do it right. You know, they still haven't done it right. You know, they, they could. They have all the money in the world, you know. Yeah. And they have, you know, their choice of whatever uh, arena they want. And they could do it, but I'm. you know what? I apologize for interrupting. I mean, you're... I'm sorry. You oh, no, no. Sorry. I was just saying the, the the level of excitement with pride was uh, was just, oh, it was just killer. It was just great. You know, and Kevin Randleman. And, oh, uh, man. Uh, he that, was the most athletic person ever to enter that octagon, man. I'm telling you. you I know. think where Randleman was on that monster card, and he had just, did he knock out uh, this guy from Serbia that was... Uh, you know the guy I'm talking about, uh, uh, Igor? 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 No, not Igor. Uh, ah, how can I not know oh, this? First time? The other name came to me was Jumbo Saruta. And uh, the guy from Serbia who looks like Lance Storm, Krokop, Mirko Krokop. Okay. Oh, hadn't God. Randleman knocked out Krokop when Krokop hadn't been beaten? It was some kind of major wow. victory. I can't remember, but it was so cool to see these guys come in and do the pro wrestling matches and monster was like it was just such a bizarre thing because it was so hokey right it was it was like wwe times 10 with the hokeyism you know yeah. it was like the craziest show i was ever part of i had uh com i completely torn a ligament and i couldn't walk 
following a match I had with Randy Orton 18 years ago. And Barry Bloom, you dealt with Barry Bloom, right? Yeah. Barry. Barry says, how you doing? I said, well, uh, not too good. He goes, can you walk? I said, not really. He said, uh, listen, Bill Goldberg uh, can't make the match because of injury. Uh, I can get you Bill's money. And I said, Barry, I don't know if I'll be able to walk, but I'll be in that ring. So I, I went up. <laughs> I came in in a wheelchair. I left in a wheelchair. <laughs> I, I, I didn't interrupt you for a second. Dad? Yes, sir. Okay, are you gonna, are you gonna make a crack up, 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 uh, to make it right now? But but he heard he heard that money. Okay, <laughs> that, that is that is always that is always busted my chops. Say that there's that uh, Sever would sell his soul for the right price. So <laughs> the right price, <laughs> any price. <laughs> <laughs> go go ahead, please. Ben. I don't know if there's any soul left to sell. You know, you pieced it out so many times. <laughs> but no, please, please finish finish up the story. Um, well, I was just just talking about how, what the the overlap in Japan, uh, where you would never have a show in the U.S. or at least at that time you wouldn't uh, have a show where anyone from the MMA world would cross over and uh, do the uh, do our stuff. But uh, it was it was a big it was a big deal. I remember when I was in when I was in Japan, there was a big deal where a guy went in and he uh, he went to the U.S. with the uh, with the media contingent. And he challenged one of the Gracies, uh, right, right. and he got his oh, he got his ass his whipped. Ass whooped, yeah, yeah. And they yes. challenged Hickson, and Nixon said, "Everybody stay out, just me and him." Yeah, you know, and he beat that son he of a did. bitch. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, a lot of and they, they picked him because he was a shooter. You know, from Japan, they thought that he was gonna, uh, and and from that point on, he became like a comedy figure, and a pretty good one. Yes. But that whole idea of being. Uh, uh, he still should have been feared by most of the public, not right. by the Gracies, I guess. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. I, I, I believe his name, his first name was Anjo, but I can't come up with the yeah, rest yeah, of yeah, I just yeah. remember, yeah. 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 They, and, had, they had the whole film crew with them uh, <laughs> trying to capture it all. And, uh, Travel all the way to the world. United States, ambush this poor guy uh, in whatever dojo he was in. And like you said, he tells him. He took control. Yeah, he took control yeah. of the whole situation. Everybody yeah. stay out. You know, I'll, I'll give you what's left, you know. <laughs> and that's what he did, man. Craziness. I guess they hear the guy scream for miles, you know. <laughs> what What about social media outlets, sir? Making if someone wants to get in contact with you, yeah. what's worth the good way for people to follow uh, you or to get in contact with you? Or I try to keep it real. So the website is realmcfoley.com. Twitter is at realmcfoley. Facebook is facebook.com slash Mick Foley. And I have a pod that's just premiered uh, called Foley is Pod, uh, where we uh, take a stroll down memory lane each week uh, with Conrad Thompson, who's kind of like the guru of this stuff. So if people want to check that out, I'm sure just go to you know Twitter, uh, Instagram, same thing, Real Mick Foley. And, uh, and we'll have some information about how you can get on over there and listen to more of my exaggerated tales. Well, that's all, as my mother used to say, don't let a few facts get in the way of a good story. No, no. Terry Funk put it this way. Any story worth telling is worth coloring up, right? So th- I'll give you an example. <laughs> I, I I love this story because it acts as a bridge for me from the independence to the, you know, the national scene. It's my tryout match with uh, World Championship Wrestling in November of 89. And when I walk through the curtain after the, doing that big elbow, further than I'd ever done it because I just put the guy out about five feet further than I intended, didn't even know, didn't think I could make him. And at the last second, I threw my arm out, so it was more of like an, a flying extended hand than it was an elbow. And <laughs> even in my head, like, I understand, okay, was it a gauntlet of superstars that you walked through, or was it four or five guys just, just randomly walking around? It's probably four or five guys randomly walking around, but dog on it. When I tell that story, it was a gauntlet of superstars, and I walked right through them, and they were, you know, like one on each side, or one on the other, you know, a line of them. And I was like, I recognize that my story is probably inaccurate, but it just sounds better that way, yeah. right? I walked through, there were three or four guys staring at me as opposed to a gauntlet of the biggest superstars of that day. Wow. It's been, been, been a while well since our last, uh, last story there, but it was, uh, you know. You know what? I had some questions, Dan, about uh, 
I, 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 it has been a while since I was like, is Dan going to show up, you know, jet black with the beard and the hair? Uh, I finally decided, like, you know what? I'm uh, f- 56. <coughs> I think the world is ready to accept that I don't have a jet black goatee anymore. And so I'm easing into the, This is the natural look here. But I, I didn't know how you'd be. I certainly wasn't going to bring that up if you chose to go no, the no, jet no, black no, I, I, I Basically, uh, I'll say that within the last, uh, well, I'll say through, through that, that COVID period, yeah. when, when you know, the world basically is, is shut down, you know, you can't go to any kind of barber shops, things of that nature. So literally, I, I had this mop of, of, of white hair. I got <laughs> right. this, this wild looking mop of white hair. I didn't shave for probably... Uh, I don't know, six, eight months. I actually had a head beard. Yeah, you know, I, I look like some old mongo is what I look like. And uh, so I basically, uh, I, I thought, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, I, it's, uh, you said that you're, you're, you're 56. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be 64 here in, uh, in June. And it's kind of going, you know, the reality June is. June what? What's I'm, your I'm birthday? Happy. June, June 9th. Ah, I'm June 7th. Yeah. I'll, I'll so, be 57. Yeah. So, so yeah, like going, it's like I, I'm just happy that I still have as much hair as I do have in the first place. So it's kind of going. So it's like going, you know, just go with it what it is. So I, I've been to, I've been to several different little comic cons of that nature, and people see the different pictures, and they they, they look they look down, they look at you, and they look down, like they go, they they know it's you. And I go, I go, that's called just for men number forty five. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and then I always would tell them, like, the story I said earlier at the beginning of the show that, that uh, in, the, 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 in the cage fighting world, where you're also you're looking for psychological advantage yeah, points sure. as, yeah. as well. I mean, because if, if you if you if you're ripped and shred like like a Kevin Rand- Randleman, I mean, I mean, I mean, he just you, you, you could have simply just put him on top of a piece of marble right, and he right. looked like a statue because he was so ripped and shredded. So I always said that you're not going to be as intimidated if you look across and you see a gray haired guy. <laughs> so that's why I colored my hair dark, the, the, the mustache dark, you know, because the, the eyebrows, the mustache, all that. I, I see some guys that they, they color their hair and then they got a gray mustache or they forget the color of their, their eyebrows. I'm going, and that was, you know, I'll say the first few times I did it, uh, sometimes I did it wrong. Yeah, right. And it was like going, oh gosh. I, I, I got. I can't wait for the next couple of weeks to pass by. I, I washed the hair, just to kind of fade it out a little bit because I went way too dark. I, I look like, uh, you know, Snidely Whiplash, you know, <laughs> you know that that kind of stuff. But no, it's. Uh, but now I'm just I'm just happy and content with what I'm doing now, and uh, I still I still travel a great deal, do a lot of instructional type of things, and do speaking things. So, so it's like what you're doing right now. You you you've got your combination, your your comedy tour slash. You're just interacting with the crowd. Yeah. Telling I, stories. I love it. You know, Dan, uh, I've said that one of the most difficult things that every wrestler faces is trying to make find something that makes them feel like they did when they were in the ring. Yes. And it becomes really, really difficult to do that. And so this is something I've found uh, telling these stories. You know, the writing that book in 99 opened up some doors for me because uh, – I was like, wow, I can reach people in a different way. And I, I made people laugh out loud with the book. And I thought, what if I could uh, venture out and, uh, and and tell stories? And uh, so I really like it. We were just talking about uh, psychological intimidation factor. And I'd like to share with this an exclusive. I don't think I've ever mentioned this. Because I did have a one-year amateur high school wrestling career. Where <laughs> a buddy of mine talked me into going out for uh, wrestling. He was uh, the co-captain of the team. And we already had a heavyweight. That was Kevin James, the the actor, King of Queens. He was uh, t- one of two guys in high school could bench 300. I wasn't the other one, trust me. And if someone had stopped me while I was walking downstairs, my dad was the athletic director, so my and my brother was an amateur wrestler. So I oh, so up, the, the, there's there's a little bit of pressure. Yeah, yeah. So I'd been to like a hundred meets, probably. Like you know, the most you know, a lot of guy high school kids have never been to a wrestling meet. So that was a part of life for us, as was wrestling my brother, because my brother was uh, a lighter, a 110, 114. You know, uh, when we wrestled, I didn't know heavyweights didn't usually throw legs in. So when I came in, I didn't have a whole lot of uh, power, and I wasn't very good on takedowns, but I could kind of wrap somebody up a little bit. 
And so I was better than I should have been for a first year wrestler. And what I did in the uh, in that one year gave me the confidence to think that I could try other things. You know, <laughs> without that, I would have never done it. But I'm I'm getting ready for like our, my third or fourth match, and uh, it's a tournament situation. So it's not just a, a dual meet, one team on one side, one on the other. And I'm sizing up my opponent. He doesn't look particularly tough. And then I see him walking up towards me, you know. We're like two matches away from wrestling. And this seems like a little bit unusual. And he walks up and he goes, I I don't think this is for me. (laughs) (laughs) This is his lead? This is what he leads with? Ah. I don't think this is for me. My mother wanted me to get involved, and I was like, "Okay, okay." okay. And now I'm torn because I don't have a lot. I don't have a lot of offense, you know. Just like in pro wrestling, like, all right, maybe I could break a guy down and try to turn him, you know. <laughs> so I was like, "Do I, I feel bad for this guy? Do I treat him gently and uh, try?" You know, here I am with three matches trying to think about how not to hurt this guy's feelings. I went, no, st- no. What a stud you are. I'm huh? not going to get many pins this year. Let me see if I can wire this guy in a hurry. And I beat him in about 30 seconds, but I'll never forget that. And I beat him simply by being able to get him down and then uh, sink the half Nelson in. And he had no defense for the Foley upper body musculature. But I'll never forget that. <laughs> this isn't for me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, I won't get That's all I need to know, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, again, talking about uh, amateur wrestling, it just uh, it, it, it is such a tough sport. You know what? When you're talking about the lessons you learn, um, I was uh, running, not a temperature, the opposite, a low temperature. Didn't feel good. The guy that I was going to be wrestling, Artie Mims from Patchogue Medford, was ranked second in the county. And he had the the mohawk at a time when Mr. T, you right, know, right. was in, oh. and he, you know, and he was big man of color. And I wasn't going to wrestle. And the coach said, Mick, uh, you know, coach, I'd grown up uh, 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 babysitting his kids on occasion because my dad had hired him, talked me into going out there, and I did pretty well until I more or less uh, threw I, – oh, I, Start of the second pe- second period, right? I'm in the top of the referee's position. And I had this thing is body scissors weren't legal until the year I started. So guys had just forgot about the body scissors. And at that time, I believe it or not, I had a pretty decent set of uh, s- strong legs. And one of the things I would do is kind of stand up and I would pull a guy back on top of me, wrap him in the leg scissors and work from there. And on this one, bell, not the bell, whistle, boom. I stand up, I try to throw Artie Mims back over on top of me, and he doesn't go. He turns in midair, and now i got to fight off my back for the whole two minutes. And I did I, valiantly, and then there was just no breath coming in. You know? So I did, in a sense, I guess I quit because I couldn't breathe. Boom. And that sound was so profound that I... Uh, slap it on the mat. Oh, slap the mat. Uh, high school uh, meet, so I lose the, the meat for us. I shook his hand, Artie's hand. I shook his coach's hand, shook my coach's hand. Then I went down in the wrestling room. I cried for 30 minutes. First time I'd cried out loud in a few years, and it'd be like another nine years before I did again. Uh, But after I was done crying. That's your wedding night? (laughs) That was your wife crying that night. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, your wife is crying. <laughs> what just, did I do? I just had this feeling that the rest of life was going to be comparatively pretty easy. Like, right. that was one of the most difficult things I ever had to do. And I thought, how I can do anything because I just did that. I just lost the meat. Uh, I don't know. I was If I had not had that loss, uh, I would have been the, the poorer man for it because it really, it really taught me a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I... Uh, I will tell you with a quick story. My, my freshman, what it sticks with you? Yeah, forever. sure does. Yeah. Right here it is, thirty my, my, years later. <clears throat> like my, my 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 freshman year in high school, my simple goal was simply trying to be the first freshman to ever make varsity. Right. So, because no one had done it at that point in time, so I, I I weighed like 165 pounds. I lost some weight. I was down at the 155 pound weight class, and when you start going up against upperclassmen, that that one, two, or three years of of physical maturity, yeah. mental maturity, but then you, you have all these additional matches and experience, stuff like that. 
I mean, I, I, I got destroyed. So I, I kept going up weight class after weight class after weight class until the last person to challenge was the heavyweight. And my, my high school coach probably should have never have, have allowed it. Probably should have never allowed me to, to challenge the heavyweight because I was nowhere near the heavyweight's size. But he allowed the match to take place. And as we're out there dancing around there and moving around, he, he basically, he somehow trips, falls down. I fall down on top of him and I pin him. So <laughs> I achieved my goal of making varsity, but it opened up so many new obstacles because, for, for, for example, you have to weigh a minimum of 175 pounds. At this time, you had to weigh a minimum of 175 pounds in order to wrestle heavyweight. Well, I, I weighed 155 pounds. But um, back then, you did that. Like, like today, you you when you weigh in, you basically are weighing in, in either a singlet or a uh, uh, just a pair of, of underwear on because they the referees they want to look at your your skin. There's always a skin uh, inspection to see is there any infantile ringworm things yeah. of that nature on your skin. So that that's for skin inspection. So back then you could weigh in fully dressed. So I would weigh in fully dressed, shoes on, my coat on, and cans of pop. In my pockets, so that I weighed up over 175 pounds. Well, that's that's and, how uh, Sakuraba weighed in when they had the the UFC in Japan. Uh, he was so light, uh, he he weighed in the same way, fully clothed and had shit in his pockets. You know, in order to really? fight, wow. in order he to was, fight in the heavyweight division. I I I, I always enjoyed again Sakuraba. Just uh, I remember being working for that same company, and then when he was just a just a green boy and. Here he is. He's you know uh, mopping floors. He's cooking the, the meals, and and uh, each every every couple of months when you go back there again, you come back there and he'd have a new shiner over this eye or his his collar. It would be that much more cauliflower up on this, and they just they really just abuse their their young wrestlers to see are they gonna pay the price and will they endure all this punishment? So it and was, and uh, it was he becomes the biggest star in Japan for, yes. you know, since Antonio Inoki, you know, thank you for watching another episode of Dan and Don's toxic masculinity. You better like subscribe and share, or I'm going to come to your house.